We're just really glad you're here to join us for this series of link trainings called Be Well Wednesdays. So I know we have a whole lot of people in our virtual room here, and we're just really excited about that. Before we kick things off, just want to acknowledge the team who has helped put this event together um, and who's working on further Be Well Wednesdays and also the partners that have helped make this possible. So I want to we want to acknowledge Fayette County Public Schools as well as CPLT, which is the Community Partner Leadership Team. And as a part of that team, we've got all the acronyms here, right? So we've got CPLT, FCPS, and finally LINK. Uh, CPLT is helping put together LINK, which is linking youth to a nurturing community. We know that there are many, many people in and around Lexington who all have a hand in serving and supporting our young people. So people from mentors to teachers to school staff to just concerned community members. Um, so we're excited to be here with that. We also want to acknowledge the uh, Lexington Public Library, CHI and St. Joseph Health, New Vista, and Amachi Lexington. So thank you so much to all of our partners who have a hand in putting this together. That's really uh, for the sake of all of our young people. So today we are going to be right at an hour. Uh, we will just be talking about good ways to support our young people, especially as they've been through kind of any various traumas all the way from COVID to dealing with other family situations and things like that. Just a couple of housekeeping things. I think as we all know, we've been on Zoom a whole lot. Keep uh, If you could keep yourselves muted, which it looks like everyone is, um, feel free to utilize the chat function if there's a question to ask, um, but we are glad you're here. Feel free to get up and stretch, move around as you need to, but we are, we again, we are very excited you're here. Um, I do want to welcome our two presenters. We've got Sharika Smith and Antonio Melton. Uh, thank you for those waves. I see those. Um, they both come to us from Fayette County Public Schools. Sharika is the coordinator of ESS, social work and school mental health services. And Antonio is the coordinator of mental health services and guidance and school counseling. So I'm going to turn it over to them. Really excited for what they have to share. Um, and uh, yeah, so we'll be finished right just a little bit before one o'clock and uh, welcome. Take it away. All right, thank you so much for that introduction, Miss Maggie. Um, Antonio and I are so excited to be here. Um, we are going to touch on mental health and trauma today. Um, as you all know, we could talk about mental health and trauma for hours and for days and weeks upon end. So um, today, I, I do apologize if we seem rushed or condensed, um, but we're trying to give you some snippets of both concepts and then invite you to a longer training with us in the future. So I wanted to throw that out there. Um, but let's begin. Today, our learning objectives really are to um, define mental disorders um, or illness, mental illness, um, discuss common mental health disorders, um, define some risk factors, as well as some protective factors, um, to understand the impact of childhood trauma, um, consider strategies for support, and to identify resources for support. Jumping right in there. Um, for the purpose of today's um, discussion, uh, we really want to kind of be on the same page in terms of what um, a mental disorder is. Um, and as you can see here, a mental disorder or mental illness is a diagnosable illness that one, affects a person's thinking, emotional state and behavior, um, as well as disrupts the person's ability to work um, or attend school, carry out daily activities, um, and or engage in satisfying relationships. So what, um, what type of words does our society use to, to describe um, mental illnesses? So typically when you think about it, um, and you can just kind of unmute and yell out some of, those, um, some of those words, how does our society usually um, categorize or define um, mental illness? Crazy. Bingo. Mm -hmm. Crazy is definitely a very nuts. Common. Nuts. Yes. Dangerous. Absolutely. Sick. Stable. Sick. Unstable. Yes. Weak. 
week. Absolutely. Um, any others? And you have in the chat, it doesn't exist for some cultures. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, that is a great point. Um, thank you for that little participation. Um, and so what we want to do today is we want to kind of like put some some actual definitions with some of those terms that may have been, you know, you know, inappropriately kind of lumped under to under some of those, you know, those terms of, you know, crazy, nuts, you know, those type of things. And so some common mental um, disorders um, are um, ADHD um, or ADD. And that is, you know, ADD is actually attention deficit. I'm sorry. Yeah. Attention deficit disorder. Um, and ADHD is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Um, and the actual definition for th those terms um, are, or those disorders, um, they're characterized by the inattention, hyperactivity, and impulsivity. They're most commonly diagnosed in young people, but it does not only affect children. An estimated 4% of adults have this disorder as well. Um, anxiety disorders. Um, and this is when, you know, feelings of intense fear and distress become overwhelming and prevent us from doing everyday activities. Um, most common um, mental health concern in the U.S., um, and it's an estimated 40 million adults in the U.S. Um, have this disorder. Another common mental disorder um, is bipolar. Um, and bipolar causes, bipolar disorder causes dramatic shifts in a person's mood their energy and the ability to think clearly. People with this order experience high and low moods um, known as mania and depression, which differ from the typical ups and downs that most people um, experience. Another common disorder is depression. Um, more than just the feeling, um, feeling sad or an ongoing, uh, ongoing through a rough patch, uh, it's a serious mental um, health condition that requires understanding um, and medical care. Without treatment, episodes of depression may last a few months to several years. Eating disorders. Um, when you become so preoccupied with food and weight issues that you find it harder and harder to focus on other aspects of your life. Um, studies suggest that one in 20 people will be affected at some point in their lives. Um, ultimately, without treatment, these disorders can take over a person's life and lead to serious, potentially fatal medical complications. Although they are commonly associated with women, men um, can develop them as well, eating disorders. Um, psychosis, another common um, disorder, uh, which is a break with reality characterized as disruption to a person's thoughts and perceptions that make it difficult for them to um, that make it, sorry, that make it difficult for them to recognize what is real and what isn't. Um, these disruptions are often experienced as seeing, hearing, uh, believing things and aren't, uh, that aren't real or have strange, persistent thoughts, behaviors, and emotions. As many as three in 100 people will have an episode at some point in their lives. Um, and the last common um, disorder that we'll discuss today or talk about today here um, is um, substance use disorder. And often co-occurring with other types of mental health problems, um, these disorders can lead to a difficulty fulfilling school and family uh, responsibilities, um, increased risk taking and legal issues. <laughs> So when we talk about, you know, um, risk factors, some of these disorders, risk factor, risk factors and uh, regarding mental illness, um, what does this mean? Um, this is really um, some of the conditions that are likely to increase um, developing a mental disorder or mental illness. Um, and this does not mean that, you know, this is a guarantee this will happen if you have any of these risk factors, um, but it just in the the, the combination of these factors can increase the likelihood of that disorder. Um, and some common risk factors include um, stressful events, abuse and trauma, chemical imbalances, substance misuse and sensitivity, um, seasonal changes, previous episodes of mental illness, uh, or presence of another 
uh, mental illness, ongoing stress and anxiety, medical conditions um, and hormonal changes, side effects of medication, illness that is life-threatening, um, chronic or associated with pain, as well as brain injuries are all, all common risk factors for developing um, a mental disorder or mental illness. Not necessarily guaranteed that, that this will always happen, but um, just a factor. But then we have some protective factors. And so protective factors are the, the opposite. These are factors that are, if a part of you know, a person's life, the more we can include, decrease the likelihood of developing a mental disorder. And again, the disclaimer is that not that having all of these factors will uh, prevent someone from developing a uh, mental disorder, um, but these are just kind of you know, the, the factors that can help decrease um, that for um, young adults and adults as well. Um, so we have healthy practices, kind of high self-esteem, um, good problem-solving skills, feeling of control in their own life, um, a sense of spirituality, avoiding alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs, um, parental support, um, regular school attendance and academic performance, um, having a good social support system, um, availability of constructive recreation, um, community bonding, as well as feeling close to at least one adult. Um, and of course, it's, to, it's noted that, you know, the one that stands out the most really is kind of having, having that one adult that you can kind of um, talk to that you feel supports you kind of in your life is kind of like the biggest um, um, contributing um, protective factor. Self-injury. Um, um, Self-injury is kind of is the behavior or symptom of mental illness. Um, the intention is to harm self, not necessarily kill um, themselves. Um, and examples include excessive exercise, pinching, um, increased drinking, um, um, in intentional sabotaging uh, relationships, staying with people who treat you terribly, or pulling hair, as well as mixing meds are all examples of self-injurious um, behaviors. Um, and sometimes the, one of the most common ones is really cutting, um, but as you can see, um, examples of self-injurious behavior kind of expands beyond just that. Um, and, you know, it, especially with, you know, young folks, I think, you know, um, it's, uh, again, it's not always, not, the intention is not to kill themselves, um, but sometimes these self-injurious behaviors can definitely lead to an accidental, um, you know, death. So, um, when we, that's why we really want to take these things seriously. We want to kind of identify them as soon as we um, can and get these, get support um, in place as soon as we can. The next, um, the next disorder we'll, issue we'll talk about is kind of suicide um, and some potential warning signs for that. Um, and in Kentucky, um, suicide is the second leading cause of death for um, folks in the, in the age bracket between 10 and 34. Um, and again, you, I guess for the purpose of this presentation, you know, that's really the, the um, age group that we're really talking about. Um, and it's you know, notable to put this into perspective or into context that you know, on average, one person dies by suicide every 11 hours um, in the state. Um, and you know, of course, you know, suicide is a completely preventable if we can recognize those signs and kind of get those folks connected um, when they do feel a sense of hopelessness. Um, so some potential warning signs that we do want to kind of grab a hold of or try to be aware of, um, and that is kind of any threat to hurt or to kill oneself. Uh, we always want to take those seriously um, and kind of move um, to, to action. Uh, seeking access to pills or weapons, um, talking or writing about death, dying, or suicide, um, having rage, anger, or seeking revenge um, can also be a sign. Um, acting recklessly, I mean, engaging in risky activities, um, feeling trapped, um, uh, expressions of hopelessness or no reason for living is also uh, a huge sign. 
um, increasing alcohol or drug use, um, withdrawal from friends, family, um, having a dramatic change in mood, um, sleeping all the time or being unable to sleep, being anxious and agitated. Um, and again, these are just some of the warning signs, some warning signs. Again, none of these warning signs are, you know, the golden, golden ticket to being able to prevent this. Um, but again, when we see these things in our, um, you know, young folks or adults, um, it's definitely something that we want to kind of ask the question. Um, <clears throat> Before we transition to trauma, um, does anyone have questions about the yeah. mental health portion? And if there's anything in the chat, someone help us read it. Yeah, I'm going to look here. Um, one thing I, I want to remind us is these are these are quick definitions, quick conversations about mental health. Uh, we can obviously go into way more detail, and we invite you to come to one of our youth mental health first aid trainings. Um, it's an actual, it's, it's about six hours, but it's interactive. We'll make it fun. <laughs> um, six hours and we go deeply into these disorders um, in youth. Um, we'll talk more details about self-injurious behaviors, which is a symptom of the mental of the illness. Not everyone with a mental illness will self-injure, will self-harm. Not everyone with a, with a mental illness will attempt suicide or be suicidal. But those are two symptoms that are truly um eye openers for us, especially in the education world, because we do have students who um, partake in self-harm. We do have students who attempt and die by suicide. Um, Antonio mentioned a stat about um, in Kentucky, I think second leading cause for 10 and, and 34, that age group. Uh, we have had students in Fayette County who have died um, by suicide at age 10. Um, so if you think 10 is too young, if you think nine, eight, seven is too young, it is not. So we want to train um, as many people, parents, teachers, community members on how to ask those, those questions. Um, so if there's ever you know, witnesses of those signs and symptoms that Antonio just showed us, you will feel comfortable saying, hey, you know, you're, you're not looking too well. Um, are you thinking of dying by suicide? Are you thinking of, of, of hurting yourself? So again, we invite you to a youth mental health first aid training. We also want to invite you to QPR, which is question, persuade, and refer. Um, and that's another a couple hours of training, and, and it really focuses on how to um, ask the question about suicide and then where to go to for help. So um, we'll transition now if there's no other questions. No? All right. So the, the second portion is, a, is about trauma. Um, again, another topic that we could train for six hours on, okay? But for this lunch series, we want to kind of touch on it give you some, some important topics to take back um, and be aware of. All right, so when we talk about trauma, it can look so different between you, me, your children. Um, what's traumatic to me may not be traumatic to Antonio. What's traumatic to him may not be a traumatic to Maggie. Um, but a, tra a traumatic event is characterized by um, someone who's actually feeling like their, their life is threatened, someone who um, has maybe witnessed a serious injury or witnessed an accident. Um, and then some of those responses to those events, um, feeling it completely fearful um, and feeling helpless and, and losing the attachment. Um, so that's kind of the definition that we're gonna go by today. All right, when we, when we talk about trauma, um, a lot of times you're not going to see the trauma all over the, the youth's face, right? You're not gonna walk in and see a kid and say, oh, you look like you've had a traumatic event. Um, but actually what we all do, our kids, everybody on this Zoom, every single day, everywhere we go, we are carrying an invisible suitcase or an invisible backpack, okay? In that invisible backpack includes all my traumatic events that I've not shared with you, all of my negative self-talk about, about the world and how the world views me. Um, it's, it's the baggage that I bring wherever I go, okay? And so if I show up at school and in my invisible backpack is the fact that I didn't eat breakfast or dinner because I don't have, have food. My teacher may not realize that, okay? But we as adults, we as caregivers, we as teachers have to realize that we don't know what our kids come with, okay? So if they're acting differently, if they're behaving in a way that's not, not typical, um, keep that in mind that we don't know what happened. We don't know what kind of state they're in. Um, so instead of always saying, what did you do? We're trying to shift our mindset to what happened to you, okay? 
again, this is a longer training and we can absolutely go into more detail about just shifting that trauma lens, um, which is gonna help our interactions um, with kiddos. So in our, in our longer trainings, we love to show this video about Zoe. Um, I know this is a short little lunch series, so I'm gonna give you a snippet, give you a tease, um, and then again, encourage you to come to um, one of the longer trainings. Can you hear Antonio? Yes, I can. Someone hurts you so bad. It stops hurting at all. Until something makes you feel again. word, every hurt, every moment. How could you ever understand where I come from? Even if you ask, even if you listen, you do not really hear or see or feel. You don't remember my story. You haven't walked my path. You haven't seen what I've seen. All right, I told you I just wanted to give you a little snippet. Um, that is a very, very powerful story, a very, very powerful um, video that we, sh we um, share in our trauma-informed care trainings, and it's we of course extend how much we, we show, but um, spoiler alert, it does end on a happy note. So <laughs> I did wanna throw that out there, but just looking at the few minutes that we saw on that screen, what potential events um, could have been traumatic for Zoe that you saw? What types of trauma did we see in that video? DV, you saw domestic violence, mm -hmm. um, physical um, child abuse violence. Mm -hmm. um, you saw her being a parent yep. to a younger sibling. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, again, I want to reiterate that things that are traumatic to one person could could not be traumatic to another. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's about, it's about perception, right? So if I see, you know, a witness something um, that maybe it just does not um, register with me as it might register with, with someone else, okay? So you may expect a child to come in after that, right? And be completely off and can be completely not themselves. Um, or some kids will come in and they want to please and they sit there and they have the best day of their life. So. And that is no judgment on how we perceive um, the situation. It's a real um, reminder that trauma affects everyone differently. So in addition to what Melody said, um, here are some other forms of, of trauma. All right, we've got neglect and physical abuse. That's what me, she's mentioned already. Um, sexual abuse, complex trauma. Um, and with complex trauma, you know, it, it's a lot of times those caregivers who are supposed to be taking care of us, right? And they are the ones who are causing the hurt and the pain. And we, and we see domestic violence and then we go to school and we come home and then we see physical abuse and we come home and then there's another traumatic event. It's just trauma after trauma. And it's almost like our, some of our kids are living in that. Um, and it's not a one you know, fix for, for that. It's just compounded. 
Um, we said domestic violence. Uh, we have a lot of students in, in FCPS who are considered homeless. Um, and a lot of times we think of homeless people as living under a bridge on the street, right? That's our mind. And that's the, the, the first thought about homelessness. But truly homelessness can mean um, your a fire has destroyed your building. And so now all of a sudden you have to move in with a family member. Um, it could mean a teenager who ran from their, their, their house for whatever reason, and now they're sleeping on their friend's couch. Um, okay, so when we think about homelessness amongst our students, it is more than just, um, you know, some students living in a car or some students um, in, a, in a homeless shelter. Community violence, that um, in itself, it can be traumatic. We've got a lot of things that we see on the news. You turn on the news and you see a tragic story every single day, basically, um, especially when, um, a lot of the situations were happening during COVID and, and right before COVID with, with the police um, violence, we saw a lot of increased um, abnormal behaviors with our kids because they were just fearful. They were confused. They saw um, protests on the, on the TV every day. They saw killings. It was just something that truly um, exasper exasperated. Um, I, I can never say that word. <laughs> it magnified the, the traumatic um, feelings that our kids were having exacerbated. That's it. Early childhood trauma and, and medical trauma, um, natural disasters. Heck, let's throw COVID in there, right? For two years, our kids have been um, completely, you know, asked to, to change and, and be isolated and, and cover their faces and um, not be nervous that this disease or, you know, this pandemic's not going to reach their family. Um, some of our students lost family members. We lost a student to COVID. Um, so that could absolutely be another traumatic event for, for someone. Our refugee population. Um, again, they, um, that population endures things that a lot of us will never understand. A lot of us will never be able to um, comprehend, but that's not, that doesn't mean that we, we shouldn't reach out and try to help, um, especially if, if they are um, exhibiting behaviors and exhibiting signs that they need help and that they want to express what's going on. School violence um, and then terrorism. Again, we can name probably five or six more types of trauma that aren't on this list. Um, and yet again, we have students who maybe come to school having dealt with some of these situations and the behaviors aren't changed, right? They, they still come to school and they still um, are able to, to function um, quote unquote okay. So when we think about triggers, um, we think about things that, um, quote, set our kids off. We think about things that happen and you're like, well, he was fine one second. And now all of a sudden he's throwing, throwing chairs. Um, we have to, to realize that sometimes we can be triggers. We can be trauma reminders for a student and not even realize it, right? Um, if I'm wearing the same perfume that, that someone's abuser wore and all of a sudden I walk by and he or she smells it, complete trigger, complete trauma reminder, and it's not intentional. And I had no clue that this perfume was, would remind him or her of his traumatic event, right? Um, teachers who sometimes will embarrass kids in front of the class because they got an answer wrong, or, you know, say, go pull a clip in front of all your peers. And, and that feeling of shame and humiliation could easily set someone off because they go home and, and they are humiliated and shamed all night by a parent or by a sibling. Um, and it's traumatic to them. And then all of a sudden you've reminded them of that situation. Um, seclusion and, and touch. You know, sometimes teachers just love to touch a kid on their back and say, great job. Um, how many times has that happened? And that kid has turned around and um, swatted at the teacher or turned around and completely escalated um, all from a simple touch. Again, that teacher not intentionally um, was not intentional on, on hurting that student or making him um, uncomfortable but it could have easily been something that triggered um, a memory of, of you know, physical abuse or a memory of sexual abuse. Um, so being really, really open and, and understanding that sometimes the behaviors that we see aren't because you know, the kid just doesn't want to, to listen to you or behave. It could truly be because something in that classroom is reminding them of a, of a horrible event. Something in that school is um, um, setting them off and, and it's a trigger for them. Think about loud noises, slamming doors, watching fire, or having, you know, being close to a fight at school. Um, 
And then the uncertainty. Um, I, I tell teachers all the time when we train, if you're going to be out, if you have a student in your classroom who you know is not really uh, good with change, then let them know ahead of time, if you can. Um, because sometimes they'll come to school, they see that you're not there, and all of a sudden it's like, I can't do this. You know, is she coming back? W what happened? Is she okay? My, is my teacher okay? Is he coming back? Um, so anytime, you know, you know that a student really needs that, those pre-plans, those um, situations ahead of time that, you know, prepare, preparing them, excuse me, for change, uh, make sure we, we do that. All right, so thinking about um, kind of those feelings that are associated with trauma reminders. Um, oh, there we go. Um, behaving reckless, recklessly. Sometimes, like I said before, we, our, our students, our young people will do things that um, are a little bit more risky than, than they normally would. Withdrawing from others. A lot of times they just don't wanna be with people. They wanna be isolated feeling like they just have no control, um, feeling like um, everything is, um, they've lost control of everything and they quote unquote are, are just going crazy. A lot of times we hear kids describe um, those feelings that way. And then feeling stigmatized, being ashamed, um, a lot of times feeling like I'm the only person who's going through this situation. Um, and so those are all examples of how some of our trauma, um, our students with trauma may, may feel. What this looks like in the classroom can, can range from, um, like I said, all of a sudden explosive behaviors or aggression or withdrawing or being really attached. It can even be students who are very clingy to their teachers or to an adult. Um, so again, just noticing those behaviors and then really trying to dig deep and, and get your team involved to figure out what's going on. And when I say team, I mean your mental health providers in your school, your school social worker, your family community liaisons, those people who can really dig deep and um, appropriately figure out if, if there's been a potentially traumatic event. Um, before I move on, I meant to add a slide, but I forgot. Our district um, actually has a partnership with our, our Lexington Police Department and it's called Handle with Care. Um, and what this does is it provides the school information if one of our students has potentially been in a, in a traumatic event, right? So if Lexington police goes to Antonio's house and um, has to arrest one of his siblings or arrest a, a guardian, um, Antonio is gonna come to school the next day, most likely in, and have behaviors that may not be typical for Antonio, okay? So what would happen is that law enforcement officer would call our, um, our dispatch, because Fayette County has their own police department, and they would say, Antonio Melton handle with care. That dispatch would reach out to Antonio School and say, Antonio Mel Melton handled with care. No confidential information was shared, no details about the event. All it does is put our school on alert and say, Antonio may be having a bad day today because, you know, uh, there was some kind of event that might have been traumatic. So we have found that that program has been so helpful to our, um, our schools because you know, sometimes kids just need a pass, right? Antonio may really just need to put his head on the desk for a few a few a minutes. Um, he may need some extra love TLC that day. Um, that does not give me the right to go ask Antonio, tell me what happened. I heard that there was a traumatic event. That's not the intention for that. Um, so I, I, I wanted to throw that program out there because I did forget to add that slide. Um, all right, so when you go to the doctor or you go to uh, maybe see a therapist, a lot of times um, in order to kind of gauge where you are or where a, a student is with, with traumatic events, a lot of our, our practitioners use what's called an ACE study. Um, and ACE stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences. And long story short, that's really a questionnaire of about 10 questions that basically say, has this happened to you? Have you been sexually abused? Has a parent been incarcerated? Have you um, ever um, witnessed a fight or been in a fight? Things, things like that, those, those situations that are potentially traumatic. And basically the higher events, the higher number that you have on that study, the more likely it is for you to develop a mental health um, crisis or a mental health illness because of that trauma, right? So knowing that, that ACE score, and putting interventions in ASAP as soon as we can um, is so helpful to prevent all these long lasting impacts that are on this slide, right? So the higher A score you have, um, it could um, increase traumatic brain injury. It could 
increased depression or suicide, um, unintended pregnancy, HIV, all of these situations can come from having a high ACE score, okay? And this is not just me saying this, this is backed by research. Um, so <laughs> don't think that I'm just, you know, saying that. This is backed by research um, and it is it's basically showing that when we put in those protective factors that Antonio mentioned before, um, especially when we know of a child who, who was dealt with a traumatic event, we can help prevent all these things, right? We can help prevent some of these long lasting impacts. All right, so if you are um, in the school working with the student or you are an adult working with a student, maybe in a mentoring program, it is our job. Um, well, um, these are ways that we can help support students who have been um, dealing with trauma, right? Our goal should be to repack that invisible suitcase. We want to fill them with positive experiences, fill them with um, great memories, fill them with counter messages. Instead of saying everybody hates me, making sure that they know that they are loved and they're cared for. Um, of course, taking the time to recognize those trigger reminders, um, not taking those personally. Again, I had no clue that this perfume was going to cause that student to, to, to be triggered. So I'm not taking his lashing out at me personally. Um, and then of course, being aware of potential A scores, which obviously no one's going to walk around and say, I've got an A score of four. But if you know that that student has had traumatic events, keeping that in mind that the more that that situation may happen, um, the more be their behaviors may be different enough. All right, so we want to kind of leave you with ways to get help. Um, and of course, we in Lexington have amazing resources out there. We have a lot of um, agencies that can provide mental health services. They can provide medication if that's a need. They can provide um, case management, um, homeless help. Um, I'm sorry, help for homeless population, substance abuse. Um, and so we want to make sure that those agencies are highlighted. Okay, there's way more than I'm going to show you on the screen, but these are some of the partnerships that we formed with Fayette County Public Schools. Um, before I get into the outside agencies, let's talk about our in-school supports, right? We have amazing um, practitioners right inside of our, our school buildings. We've hired um, additional mental health um, specialists in our schools. And these are licensed clinical social workers. They're um, certified social workers who are in, in uh, supervision. They are licensed counselors and also counselors who are in supervision. They're licensed psychologists. We have that, that um, expertise right in our school buildings, okay? Um, we have family resource coordinators who can help with um, those, those housing needs. They can help with, um, re again, reducing those barriers to, to learning, reducing those barriers to, to um to living, honestly. Um, we have school social workers in our building. Um, they are instrumental in helping with um, truancy and educational neglect. So if a kid's just not showing up to school, if you think about it in elementary, if a kid's not showing up to school, that's an adult issue, right? It's most likely the adult who's not doing something. When you get into middle and high, a lot of times kids can make their own decisions. And, <laughs> you know, if they're um, in charge of getting themselves to school and they refused and that comes that becomes more of, of the kids issue but nine times out of ten ten times out of ten um, it leads to something bigger right they're being bullied at school um, there's a mental health need that's not being met um, there's something traumatic happening that, that we have not addressed um, so utilizing your student support um, team at your schools at your at your kids schools if you're in a mentoring program and you're working with kids find out what school they go to and, and reach out um, if there's a release or encourage parents to reach out and say, these are the people who you can go to at, at your child's school. Um, there is a, a website, and Antonio, do you mind to put this in the chat? It's fcps.net slash get help. And our parents can get on this website and fill out whatever they need and an email would automatically go to their school student support team and say, uh, Miranda Scully is reaching out for um, mental health services for, for her child, right? So our parents need to know that this, this can be um, something they can do on their phones. It's, it's a resource right at their fingertips. We also have um, a website that was created by our own Rainy Minikin. I think she's on this call. Um, and this resource, it's, it started out with when we went to, to um, quarantine for COVID, but it has expanded to um, 
just really providing resources for our staff, for adults, for all students in all grade levels, um, community agencies. Um, and so we can put that, that resource in the chat for you as well. So beyond our school, um, of course, I'm just gonna highlight a few of our community agencies, the Ridge and, and Peace Hospital. Um, those are two agencies that we, we utilize when our, when our students um, and if, if an adult is in crisis, um, if they're expressing signs of, um, of suicide or expressing any ideation, thinking they want to um, hurt other people or hurt themselves. Those two agencies can come to our building with parent permission and assess them on the spot. They can do assessments over the phone now, they can do assessments over Zoom now. So um, those two agencies are, have been instrumental in providing that immediate crisis support. Same with New Vista. Um, and a lot of these other agencies, NECO, PS, that's Bluegrass Health First, and they and Optimal Living, they provide services in our school buildings. There are some schools who partner with these agencies. And so if there's a student or a parent who wants outside um, therapy, but they don't want their kid to miss school or they don't have the transportation in the evening to get them to their appointments. Then we have therapists outside agencies that are in our buildings that can do that and build insurance. Um, and of course, NAMI, which is the national, I'm gonna say the wrong, Association of Mental Illness, I believe. Uh, no, National Alliance. Um, that is an amazing resource and they have um, a great website that you can get resources about mental health on there as well. And then the Suicide Prevention Hotline. If you know of a kid who just won't really open up, but you know that they're, they're feeling some type of um, depression or they're showing signs of, of suicidal ideation, you can give them this number, 1-800-273-TALK, um, or they can actually text now, um, and I should know that number, 78781, I believe. We can find that, that number, but a lot of our youth, they may not want to come talk to a social worker or a counselor at school, right? So they may just want to use their phones and call or, or even text when they need help. All right, so we want to open up the um, Zoom room for any questions, comments, things that you kind of want me, me or Antonia to expand on um, with either the mental health section or the trauma-informed care section. Thank you, Tara, for putting that crisis line in there. Um, I will say that, again, we have a trauma-informed care training that we can come to your agency and provide. We can do a little snippet of three hours or we can do a six hour long um, training as well for you. So same with the mental health first aid and QPR. We, we were so excited to do this little lunch series, um, but please know that there's way, there's way more um, information that we can share with you. And we want to either come to your agencies and do that or, or have a parent training or a teacher training. So um, Antonio and I will put our contact in the, chat boxes so you can reach out to us if you want um, any additional information. And I hear there's door prizes, so don't hang up just yet. <laughs> I have All a right. question. Um, sorry, if I'm cutting somebody else off. Um, you mentioned, I know you said that you all can do the trainings, but did you have any uh, upcoming or the longer ones that, that we could possibly attend? So that's one question. And then two, along the lines of, of your ACE training or your trauma-informed in, care, rather. Um, are you all seeing more or doing more with um, adding the positive side of it? So where they're kind of changing it from ACEs to PACEs and, and including those positive um, experiences as well? Like, is that a portion? Because I'm trying to I get more on that as well, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, to answer your first question, at, at this time, I don't believe we have anything scheduled, but it's, it's, not, a, um, it's not a difficult thing to, we, what we really do right now is, is answer to requests. So we got a request from a school in Louisville, for example, and we're, we're going there to train um, next month. Um, and then some of, we, we, we offer it to our schools and then they kind of schedule with us. Um, a lot of times in the summer, that's when we will host um, a training because teachers are off, they can come and they can get PD. Um, so that's when we kind of schedule those for our school folks. But at any time we can schedule for, um, you know, work with an agency and, and um, get something set up for the agency. 
Um, as far as the the aces and adding the positives, I love it. It sounds amazing. Um, but we, I have not really um, included that in the training just yet, but that's something that we are absolutely um, interested in adding because you're right. Sometimes we need to start with the good stuff first. So I appreciate you suggesting that. Can we answer any other questions? Who is the best contact for our homeless students? Um, actually, she was on this call a second ago. Did she hang up? Did she get off? So we have we have several people um, who you can reach out to. Uh, if you need a district contact, um, you can reach out to Sine Carter. I'm gonna put her name in this chat. Or Joe Scully. That last name may sound familiar. <laughs> Um, and I'm also going to put Tony Dunn. There's a few. I'm sorry. I know it's a lot. But if you if any of these um, names sound familiar, then there you go. Laura Van Epps. We have a team who um, uh, can help with with this. If now if you know a school that is I mean, a student at the specific school um, who is dealing with homelessness, you can also reach out to their family resource coordinator um, at their school. All right, any other questions? All right. Well, thank you all so much for your time. I will let um, Miranda do the fun part. <laughs> all right, thank you, Sharika and Antonio. Can we do a virtual round of applause with your uh, reaction either here or you can get that going, whichever works for you. Thank you so much for, for providing us with that information. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us. We wanna make sure that you are aware of upcoming um, sessions or Be Well Wednesday series as part of our series. Um, to the response about the positive side, that's one thing we wanted to be mindful of is ending this series on a positive note with youth developmental assets. And so we will dive into that on May 18th with New Vista uh, to provide that information. And then on April 20th, we'll be back again between 12 and one for helping children navigate through grief. So please join us for um, both of those. And then if you guys wouldn't mind, take a moment to complete the survey. You can either use the link that was put in the chat box or use your phone and use the QR code. Um, we just wanna get your feedback about today's session as well as get your feedback on what we can do in the future to provide um, information that's beneficial to you and the work that you do to support youth.